Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Edelman, and I am a program analyst for the Division of Energy Assistance with the Office of Community Services. On behalf of OCS, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, which will provide a 60-minute review of the FY 2022 Household Report long form. Today's webinar will be presented by Melissa Torgerson of Verve Associates and Dan Bausch of Apprise. Today's webinar will focus on the reporting requirements of the FY22 Household Report. The purposes of this webinar are to review the key requirements for completing the FY2022 Household Report long form, to explain my, the minor changes for the FY22 and provide reminders of report changes planned for next year's report, which will be for FY2023, to explain the approach for reporting on households assisted with supplemental funds, including American Rescue Plan Act, otherwise known as ARPA funds, to review examples of different reporting scenarios, to review the process for submitting and updating the report. The audience for today's webinar includes new and experienced LIHEAP state and applicable territory coordinators, as well as staff that assist with completing the household report long form. We greatly appreciate you joining us today, and we hope this webinar is helpful to you as it's helpful to you as you complete your household report for fiscal year 2022. Melissa, please take it away. Thanks, Peter. So today's webinar is 60 minutes, as Peter said. There are slides already available for download in the handout section of the GoToWebinar sidebar. And the webinar is being recorded and will be published on the ACF YouTube channel. If you have a question during the webinar, you're um, encouraged to type them as you go into the question box. And there's a little graph here that shows where to do that. Um, the staff at Apprise will review your questions and will respond at the end of the webinar. And if there isn't time to get to your question or it's very specific to you or your state, we'll go ahead and send you an email response. So this is, um, as we said, a 60 minute uh, webinar. It's pretty dense. There's a lot of material. Many of you will um, kind of hear it once and hear some of it, but need to go back and take a look again or as you're doing the report, you might wanna go back and review these slides to check in on something. So this is kind of a table of contents or an index that'll help you go back and find the pieces of information that you might be looking for. We wanna start with a poll because we love polls. Um, so this question is, how experienced are you with working on the LIHEAP household report long form? Are you new to this report so you haven't worked with it at all? Not too much, so maybe you've had one or two years experience. You're somewhat experienced, so maybe three to four years, or you're very experienced, uh, and that's five plus years. Note we're not asking you how comfortable you are with the form, just how much experience you have with it. You could be very experienced and still not be terribly comfortable with it. So we're really just asking about your experience here. Looks like most attendees have voted already, so I can go ahead and close it. We'll take a look. So it's about um, even across all categories. So um, for those of you who are new to the report, this will be a lot of information at once. Um, for those of you um, of you who are more experienced, hopefully you'll learn something new today or, or maybe um, learn a new trick to make the report uh, an easier process. So, um, so with that, we'll get started. Dan. Hello, thanks, Melissa. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Bausch. I'm a, a project director at Apprise uh, who helps work on the household report and other reports. Th thank you for joining us today. Um, we know it's a busy time of year and appreciate you being here and your time. So just to frame, frame the household report, this is one of uh, the longer standing 
annual LIHEAP reports that uh, state grantees and some territory grantees have had to submit. Um, the House report goes back decades uh, and states and, ter and applicable territories complete a longer form version of that we're reviewing today and tribal recipients complete a shorter uh, version of the form. So the, the household report is very important because it helps give you, it helps give Congress, it helps give the public and stakeholders information about uh, the number of households that are being served by, by LIHEAP. And some of those data items are required by the LIHEAP statute. Uh, the way the household report is designed now is you report information on the number of households who receive different types of LIHEAP assistance and the number that receive uh, any type of LIHEAP assistance. And you're also asked to report information on the number that applied for different types of assistance. Those are put into reports that go to the administration and Congress. They're published in the data warehouse, so you can find your own state's data and other states' data going back to 2000 in the data warehouse, um, and they're used to help answer questions uh, that come up about the LIHEAP program. So here's an example in uh, FY 2021, state grantee recipients assisted 5.39 million households with LIHEAP. Uh, you'll see that uh, posted in different spots on the LIHEAP website, and that figure, it comes directly from uh, each, each of the state uh, grantee recipients in the household report long form. So the household report is one of uh, several reports that HHS asks each grant recipient to submit. And this slide is really helpful if you just want an overview of all the reports and, and see how they relate and connect. Um, model plan is, is really what you're going to do in the fiscal year that's coming up. The household report is what is the number of households served in the prior fiscal year. So that's uh, an annual report focused on your activity for a 12-month fiscal year period. Grantee survey is also looking back at the prior year and how funds that were available were obligated through the year. Performance measures uh, module two is looking at the impact that LIHEAP had on household energy burdens and on um, access to energy service in the past year. There's the financial reports, the carryover report that we did a webinar on recently and, and the SF-425. And the newest one is the quarterly LIHEAP report, which is uh, the first that's submitted on a quarterly basis where you're providing a few key indicators of LIHEAP activity during the past quarter. So how many households got assisted, uh, how much funds were obligated or remaining, and so forth. So they all relate together and the household report is focused on households served in a fiscal year. Okay, so we wanted to start off with what, what, what to expect for the 2022 report that's, that's due in December. Um, so first, there's no major changes to the report from last year. So the reporting requirements and the data points remain the same as what uh, we reviewed last year in the training webinar and in last year's materials. There are, aren't any new fields you have to report that weren't there before. Um, there's not any that were removed that were there before. Um, grant recipients can use the same procedures. You can use the same queries you had to complete the report as in the past. The only nuance here is if during fiscal year 2022, you made a big program change, then you might need to account for that in how you're reporting on the household report in a way that you didn't uh, for 2021. So for example, if, if you're one of the states that um, uh, retained your ARPA funds and, and only began serving households with them during 2022, then this household report would be the first one where you're gonna have to report information on households, the subset of households that received those ARPA funds. Uh, as in the past, this, this report, you're gonna be asked to submit in the OLDC system. And the instructions and training materials from last year are still um, applicable uh, for, for, for this year and the requirements. So no major changes to the reporting requirements. 
there has been a minor change to the layout of the form and the way it's going to look for you in OLDC. Um, and we wanted to explain this to you. So HHS went ahead and added a fourth line for each type of assistance. So the report last year had three lines for heating assistance, for example. There was the first line for uh, total heating assistance, any funding source. Then there were two uh, subset or filter lines. There was a line for heating assistance with CARES funds and a third line for heating assistance with American Rescue Plan Act funding. There's been a fourth line that's added that's reserved in the event that uh, additional LIHEAP supplemental funds are released in the future. So that line is not uh, relevant for the FY22 report. You do not need to enter anything there and OCS is working to have that line um, blocked from editing so, there, uh, so that you, you can't enter anything there to, to avoid any confusion. So the format will change, the line numbering has changed as a result, but all the actual fields are the same that you need to enter data for. Okay, so we also wanted to note that there, there have been changes that are proposed for the household report, uh, not for this year, but for the future. So in January, HHS issued a dear colleague letter about proposed changes to the report to collect new demographic items that uh, were, have not been collected before for LIHEAP. Uh, there was a federal register notice in July about this asking for comments and a second notice uh, about this proposal was issued recently um, before the proposal sub is submitted for, to OMB for approval. So we're gonna talk more about this uh, at the end of the webinar, just to, to tell you what's been proposed and how you can be uh, planning for that. Uh, but these changes do not impact this report. These are things uh, that would be beginning for next year's 2023 report. Okay, um, so for the 2022 report, it will be available in OLDC, but it's currently not available yet because uh, OLDC has been adding that reserved line. Um, OCS just issued the action transmittal today for the household report, and they are going to follow up with communications to alert you once uh, the report's open in OLDC. Should be pretty soon. Um, there has been, uh, there's no change to the plan due date. The household report uh, historically is due December 30th, and uh, the due date for final data is December 30th. So. Um, once the report's available in OLDC, you'll be able to go in and, and fill it in, and you should be working towards uh, being ready to submit that report at the end of December or by the end of December. All right, now we're going to go into some key concepts as you're uh, preparing to complete the report and just some general reminders about reporting items. Okay, so let's start by just talking about what data you need to put together this report. This is um, the household report. So for each household, you're gonna need a certain set of data and that includes the types of assistance received and the funds used for that assistance. So this is regular assistance, heating and cooling, crisis assistance, weatherization or nominal benefits, which is, um, done uh, with SNAP, it's sometimes called the Heat and Eat program. You'll need the household poverty interval, and this is going to be based on their poverty level, which is based on gross income. So if you go all the way back to the raw data, you're going to need the gross income and household size for your households in order to calculate the poverty level and then to be able to put those households into a poverty um, category or in interval. And then you're also going to need vulnerable member information. So um, many of you are, should be or are asking your folks um, who apply, um, whether they're elderly, disabled, or there are children under six in the household. And um, keep in mind, this isn't just for the head of household. You're looking at all members of the household when you are looking at applications and data, whether or not a member of the household is elderly, disabled, or a young child under six. 
we also have two optional data points, young children under the age of three and young children aged three to five. And so that's really going to be your young children under six, but you're going to do a further breakdown of that data. Another key concept to remember is that this year's household report looks at both assisted and applicant households. So assisted households are folks who received a LIHEAP um, benefit using federal LIHEAP funds during the federal fiscal year from October 1 to September 30. You're reporting on households, so not the total person or just the head of the household. You're reporting on um, the household unit. And you shouldn't be counting approved households that did not receive assistance. So some of you may approve folks in one year and then not give them assistance until the following federal fiscal year. And this is especially true if you don't run your program on the, the federal fiscal year, if say you run it from January to December. Um, the folks who end up in this report should be households that have actually received assistance, not just those who were approved. The second part of the report sections uh, four and five look at ap applied applicants. So people who came and applied for assistance. Um, and this definition isn't, um, there isn't a solid definition at the federal level. It's, it's left to grantees to define what this means. So most grantees look at these as anyone who applied whether they got assistance or not. But many of you collect information on these households differently. So for some of you, this may just be adding in those households that were denied or voided, or you, know, you have information in your system for them. Um, but they did not receive a benefit. And for some of you, you actually collect information on everyone that applies, um, not just those that were denied or voided. So you have a really big base of people um, in, this, in this count. We know it's different among states, so you can just add a note in the notes section to explain what your applicant uh, data consists of. For the household report, you're always reporting households and not individual benefits. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about unduplicated benefits. And we'll show you a graph here in a second, but we'll talk through some examples first. For each line of the report, a household is only counted once in that line. So for example, if the Johnson household came in and got two crisis benefits during the year, maybe one in the winter and one in the spring, um, and it's part of a year round crisis program, they're still only gonna be counted once in that year-round crisis program line, even though they receive two benefits, because we're counting households, not individual occurrences of benefits. And households should be reported for each applicable type of assistance they receive. So if the Lee household came in and got one heating benefit and one cooling benefit, the Lee household is going to be counted once under heating and once under cooling, but only once under bill payment and any type of LIHEAP assistance. Let's look at a chart to make this a little bit easier. So these reminders up front here, the household report requires you to report an unduplicated count. Bill payment assistance, um, the line is reporting the count of households that received one benefit used to pay a share of the household energy bill and utility deposits. So that does not include assistance for weatherization or equipment. And then any type of assistance is just what it means. LIHEAP weatherization, equipment repair replacement, any LIHEAP assistance, um, you're gonna count households in that line. So if we look at this example here, I um, process the unduplicated um, count concept best by colors and dots. And so if you look at heating, let's say you have a big whiteboard in your office and you assign every household a color. And every time they come in to get assistance, you're gonna put their color dot in the, in the line where they got assistance. So in the case of heating, Jones came in um, for a heating benefit, Smith came in, Rodriguez came in, and then Jones came in a second time. So there are actually two blue dots for Jones in the heating category. When you do an unduplicated count, you wanna count colors, not dots. We're, we're not looking at individual benefits. We're looking at how many households were served. And even though Jones got two benefits, we're only gonna count the color of his dot, not the number of his dots, if that makes any sense. 
Same for cooling and weatherization. So for each type of assistance, you're counting the number of colors in each assistance line. When we get to any type of assistance and bill payment assistance, these are those bigger overarching categories. So any type of assistance is gonna be across all components. I'm gonna count all of the colors. You can see Rodriguez got three benefits, heating, cooling, and weatherization, but I'm not gonna count Rodriguez three times. I'm not counting his dots. I'm counting the color, which is red. So when I look at any type of assistance, I have four households that were served across all categories. Bill payment assistance, once again, is when you give someone a benefit that's going to help them pay a portion of their bill. So in this case, we're not going to count those people in the weatherization category because that's not bill payment assistance. I'm just going to look at the number of colors in heating and cooling, and there I have three households, Jones, Smith, and Rodriguez. So that's one way to think about unduplicated counts. We're not looking at occurrences or the number of benefits that were given out. We're looking at the number of unique households that were served across different um, uh, benefit types. And the same concept really applies for any type of vulnerability. Now, I don't have a pretty dot chart here, but the concept here is that um, you're really only counting the household in each column. So um, a household with the multiple members with the same vulnerability type should only be counted once under each column. So if um, uh, my family went in and both my husband and I were disabled, I'm really only going to get counted once under the be disabled line. Um, even though there are two of us in the household, um, we're still just one household that goes in that line. And similarly, that column D is a little like the any type of assistance or, or bill payment assistance in that it's an overarching category. You shouldn't be just adding the number of um, folks in A, B, and C in order to get that D number. We're once again looking at um, the number of households or colors um, where any type of vulnerability was present. So let's look at an example on the next page. Um, Dan's put together this cool chart. And it looks different than the dots, but the concept is the same. Household A has an elderly member and a disabled member. So you can see the two highlighted greens across the line in household A. And then household B, disabled member and a young child. Household C, an elderly member. And household D, no vulnerable members. And so when you go down and you're reporting in the elderly column, you're not going to be counting the number of people who are elderly in household A or the, ca the count of people who are elderly in household C. You're just looking at, yes, they had an elderly member, one or more elderly members, and you're counting each household once. And then it's the same across um, horizontally when you get to that any type of vulnerable column. If there are any yeses in those three columns, elderly, disabled, or young child, you're going to, you're going to, put a one in any type of vulnerability. You're not going to you're not going to put a number two um, because household A had an elderly and a disabled. You're just going to count them once in that any type of vulnerability line. And you can see that then um, in the bottom row. This this um, can be a tough concept because there are a lot of categories not the concept itself, but there are a lot of categories and numbers to keep track of um, across different things. And so honestly, if you need help with this, um, give a prize a call. We won't just talk you through it. We can even help you with your data. Just um, don't spend a lot of time on this. If you're struggling, give us a call and we'll help you out. Just some um, key reminders, we're talking about households that received assistance during the federal fiscal year. As I mentioned before, many of you run different program timelines, um, but uh, the federal government doesn't care about your program year. They care about the federal fiscal year, which is October 1 to September 30. And so you should be including folk or households who uh, were, were served and assisted regardless of what your funds they're from. So this does not look at year funding sources. There are other reports for that. This looks at how many households did you serve, regardless of whether you're serving them last year's funds or this year's funds. Were they served in this time period? 
If you say that you plan to provide a particular type of assistance in your FY22 model plan, we expect to see households reported under that type of assistance in your household report. And it will generate an error if there's a discrepancy there. Uh, we also only expect you in section two to report households that fall within the gross income thresholds specified in your model plans. So um, there are there are instructions, detailed instructions for how to uh, put people into different categories. They should be based on the 2021 HHS poverty guidelines, and there's a link here for that. Um, if you have households that fall outside of the income thresholds you've laid out in your model plan, that will also generate a validation error, and, um, and you'll see that on, on the screen, or a prize will be calling you to check that out. Reminder number two, collecting and matching data from program partners. Some of you have different parts of your programs uh, contracted out to different agencies or organizations. For example, crisis or weatherization assistance is sometimes uh, performed by um, local agencies or uh, partner state agencies. And so in those situations, you will need to get household level data from subgrantees or program partners who record this information. And in, you need household data because you have to do that dot count um, and the color count. You need to be able to tell how many households got any type of assistance. And the only way to do that is to get household level data. Now, we can give you assistance with requesting this data or negotiating a data exchange. We also have templates online available that you can just hand to your weatherization partners or, or your subgrantees and say, can you fill this out? And it will get you all the data you need for your report. So if you need help finding those or any other assistance, please call us. And reminder three, always include notes. Um, so if you receive a warning message in OLDC, you should be using the notes section to explain why. And this year, the notes section will actually prompt you to enter explanation um, uh, regarding the reliability or validity of your data. These are all reviewed and provide context. If a price sees an issue with your report while they're reviewing it um, and they see a note, um, it, it may, um, it may make it possible for them not to call you. <laughs> they may be able to just understand from your note what's going on and, and move on. So it's really important that you include them. And they're also used in the report to Congress to provide context for the numbers that legislators and the public might be looking at. And now we're gonna talk about uh, more reporting guidance and Dan's gonna take it over. Yeah, we're going to spend some time on uh, reporting for the different supplemental funds and the different populations for each each line. Um, and this is uh, th this is important, especially if you're new to the report or if you know last year maybe you didn't use any supplemental funds to serve households, but uh, this year you're you're going to be reporting on households served with your ARPA funds in 2022, for example. All right, so there's three lines uh, for each type of assistance uh, that are open for reporting in the 2022 report. Uh, this is really important. The first line is the whole population that received that type of assistance with federal LIHEAP funds. So they could have received it with regular funds, with CARES funds, with ARPA funds, with infrastructure funds, with a mix of those funds. So this would be the maximum uh, pool of people who received assistance. Anybody who received heating assistance, for example, during the fiscal year gets reported in line one. Line two and line three are really reporting uh, subsets out of that population, reporting the subset that got each type of sub, uh, assistance with each type of supplemental funds. So uh, we're going to look at this in a graphic way on the next slide. Okay, so this is, uh, th this is the population of everyone who received a certain type of assistance during 2022, this big uh, blue circle, blue pie. Um, so everyone that got assistance, let's say heating assistance, gets put in the first line uh, on the household report for that type of assistance. This includes households that 
might have gotten assistance with regular funds or assistance with CARES or ARPA or infrastructure, as I said. And it's a household that, that got a benefit, that, that type of assistance at any point from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. So it is possible they applied at the end of September in 2021, for example, and got the benefit later, uh, they would still be counted here. Now we're gonna filter down to line to, to those who got care. So out of the full, full pool of people, maybe you have a small portion of households or a medium portion of households or a large portion, but maybe you have some portion that received their benefit paid in part by CARES funds. That's represented here by this uh, yellow uh, smaller circle within the larger blue circle. Uh, those households get reported on the second line for each type of assistance. So they're still in the count that gets reported on the first line, but you're filtering down and just reporting uh, the exact number who got assisted with CARES on the second line. So again, the box here helps explain it if you go back to the slides later. And this really just tells HHS uh, and, and the public and, and others who access the report that out of the large, out of the, let's say, um, let's say 5,000 households that were received a certain type of assistance, some portion of those 5,000, maybe 500, maybe 4,000, were assisted in part or in whole with CARES Act funds. Now we're gonna take a look at households that got assisted with uh, ARPA funds. So this is another portion of the full population that received that kind of assistance in 2022. Some pool, you may have assisted with ARPA, you might've assisted uh, households exclusively with ARPA, or you might've assisted households by mixing your funds or providing supplemental benefits. In this graphic here, you can see that some small portion of households received uh, both CARES and ARPA based on the overlapping of the two circles. But let's focus in on this green ARPA group. So for the green ARPA group, that count is going to be reported on the third line in the household report for each type of assistance. Um, once again, the information in this box helps explain it but let's go to the next slide and we'll see what it looks like in the form again. So here's what the form looks like again in OLDC. There are the three lines at the top. Again, that fir the first line we're gonna focus on for this slide is the total uh, population of households that receive that type of assistance with any federal LIHEAP funds. That includes all of the supplemental federal funds um, that, that were available in FY22 or that uh, you had available from carrying into FY2022. The key point here is that this is consistent with, with what has been reported in, in years past uh, in the sense that anyone who received a type of assistance is reported in this line. Going down to line two, the CARES uh, subset line, you'll be reporting the, the number of households that you already, re you already reported these households in the number in line one, but now you're breaking out and reporting the, the number that received CARES Act funds uh, specifically. You would wanna exclude any households here that uh, didn't receive LIHEAP CARES Act funds or that wasn't used to help pay for their benefit. So the, so as a, as a grant recipient, you, there may be different ways that you might approach this, but you really need to have a way to identify uh, for, for each household the funding source, funding source or sources used to pay for their benefit. So again, a key point here is the same households that you report here are still included in line one, but the line two and line three and line one, the same household can be reported in, in all three lines. Okay, third line is for the ARPA funds. Um, and this is where you'll report uh, the, the subset of households that received ARPA funds. And we're gonna look at some actual examples later in the webinar to help make this a little bit more concrete. 
but again, this is focused on those American Rescue Plan Act funding. Uh, these households you report here should be in line one. They could be in line two if the same household got assistance with uh, heating assistance from CARES funds and American Rescue Plan funds. But for many of you, you, you will not have uh, a lot of information to report for CARES Act funds uh, if since you use those funds uh, primarily before FY 2022. All right, so we know this can be a lot to take in, but we just want to emphasize for you that with CARES and ARPAs, um, there's, there's certain things to remember and be aware of um, that uh, there's some examples here of when you would need to report on the supplemental funding lines. If you provided supplemental benefits with ARPA funds during 2022 or, or, or with uh, remaining CARES funds, if you served uh, more households using those funds, or if you started a new assistance component uh, specifically with supplemental funds, there's places to report that on the household report. Okay, um, to identify the households that received uh, the supplemental funds and report them in the initial sections of the report, the assisted household sections, um, you're, you're, you're going to need to identify households that received a benefit that was fully or partially paid with supplemental funds and to count them on those second or third lines. Um, if you didn't use any CARES funds to assist households in FY 2022, then the second line will not be applicable for you. If you, um, if your ARP, same for ARPA, if for a type of assistance, you didn't use ARPA funds, then that third line will be zero for that type of assistance. The household report has two sections toward the end, as Melissa mentioned, that ask for information on the number of applicants. And with the number of applicants, because there's not a, a concrete definition for what constitutes an applicant and it can vary by state, um, you, you need to uh, uh, define applicants based on uh, your state and your procedures and, and to, report, um, to report information using, using an approach that's acceptable. Um, there's different ways of doing this. If you have a separate application for a type of assistance, for example, uh, a special crisis application, then you can use the number of applicants who filled out that application to help report um, the number of applicants in the household report. If you don't have a separate application form or process uh, for the supplemental funds, then you can report the number of applicants based on uh, the number that applied for that total type of assistance, that's okay. Or you can report on uh, the number who got the assistance once you began using supplemental funds to help uh, provide that assistance type. So there's flexibility here, different options. The main, the main takeaway is if you provided, let's say cooling assistance during 2022, and you're gonna report households that were assisted with cooling, it's expected that you will also report the number that applied for cooling assistance. And next slide. All right, we're gonna look at some examples here of uh, different scenarios to help show you what this would look like in the household report. So scenario number one is a grantee that used, uh, used their ARPA funds, for example, to provide supplemental funds. So we're gonna look at uh, grant recipient X. So they provided 5,000 households with heating assistance using their regular LIHEAP funds. So there's no line in the report where you just report on households assisted with regular funds. Because remember, line one is the total that got assistance with any kind of funds. There isn't a separate line for just regular funds. So I'm not going to put anything in the table on the right yet. What else did they do? Okay, they used their ARP, ARP Act funds to provide those 5,000 households, all of them, with, uh, with uh, a supplemental heating benefit. So 5,000 households got a supplemental benefit paid with the ARPA funding. So we'll go ahead and put 5,000 on line three for heating assistance with ARPA funds. 
they also had uh, had some CARES funds left in 2022, and they decided to use those to provide another second supplemental payment to 500 households. So we're going to go ahead and put 500 on line two. All right, because the supplemental benefits they issued were supplemental, they were additional second, third benefits to the same households. We, we know that the total unduplicated count of households they assisted with heating assistance was 5,000. So we are gonna put 5,000 on the first line now. 5,000 households got heating assistance. Of those 5,000 in line two, we can see that 500 out of 5,000 received uh, assistance from CARES Act funds. And then line three tells us that all 5,000 received some of their heating assistance from the ARPA funds. <laughs> uh, for crisis and weatherization, they didn't use any crisis or weatherization assistance uh, where, they, where they use CARES or ARPA funds. So we'll go ahead and put zero on those lines. They did serve 2,000 households with crisis assistance. So we're going to put uh, year-round on the crisis assistance line, we'll put 2,000 for year, the year-round crisis assistance they provided. And they provided weatherization to 500 households. So we're going to put 500 on line 10, the first line for weatherization. So again, they didn't use supplemental funds for their year-round crisis or their weatherization. They, uh, uh, they served a total of 2,000 for year-round, 500 for weatherization. And that goes on the first line for each of those assistance types. So when we come down to the bottom here, any type of assistance, we're going to need to look across the assistance types and deduplicate, find, find out how many households there are across all the assistance types without counting the same household twice. When we do that, we find that 6,000 households received any type of assistance, and that goes in that top line for any type of assistance, line 14. When we look down at the CARES and ARPA lines, since they only used CARES uh, lines to give 500 households heating assistance, we're going to put 500 here. And since they only used the ARPA funds to provide that extra, that supplemental benefit for heating assistance to 5,000. We're going to put 5,000 down here in line 16. All right, going on, scenario two, if you serve new households with the supplemental funds, we're going to look at a quick example of that. So in this case, uh, this grantee provided 5,000 households with heating assistance, again, using their regular funds. They, but they decided to use their CARES funds and ARPA funds to serve additional households with heating assistance. So some households got heating with regular funds, other households got heating with the supplemental funds. Let's say 3,000 got, uh, got heating assistance with the CARES funds, and for ARPA, 2,000 with the ARPA funds. So those 5,000 got assisted only with supplemental funds. Because each household only received one type of assistance, we know that, and we know 5,000 received heating assistance with regular funds, 5,000 plus 3,000 plus two equals 10,000 households that were served in total. So the top line, line one, is 10,000, of which 3,000 got assisted with CARES funds and 2,000 got assisted with ARPA funds. Uh, they did not issue crisis or weatherization with CARES or ARPA. So we put zero on, on the uh, CARES and ARPA lines for those types of assistance. They did serve 2,000 households with crisis and 500 with weatherization using their regular LIHEAP funds. Since they didn't use the supplemental funds, that's uh, all their funds. So we're going to put that, uh, uh, we're going to put line uh, 2,000 on the first line for crisis and 500 on the first line for weatherization. When we look across the types of assistance and count each household only once, there's 10,500 households. So we'll put that in line 11. <laughs> then when we look back up in the report, we see the only, the only households served with CARES were the 3,000 that received heating assistance. So we're gonna put, pull down that 3,000 and put it in line 15. And then we're gonna do the same for 
uh, ARPA line 16 is 2000 because they only used ARPA for that year round crisis figure. All right, uh, real quick, we'll do scenario three, new assistance component. This grant to use their CARES funds in 2021, so all the CARES lines can be left as zero. They did not use their ARPA funds for standard heating assistance, so we're gonna put zero on line three. They did provide heating assistance, of course, and they served 7,000, so we're gonna put 7,000 in line one. They did not use CARES or ARPA for weather uh, uh, crisis or weatherization, so we put zero on those lines. But they did serve 3,000 households with crisis and 500 with weatherization using their uh, standard LIHEAP funds or their infrastructure funds. So we'll put those on um, the top line for crisis and the top line for weatherization. And they used their ARPA funds to create a new crisis program in 2022, a disaster relief program. So that's going to go under the other crisis line. We're going to put uh, they served 100,000 with that new program. So that goes on the first line for that special crisis program. And it goes on the ARPA subset line since all 1,000 were assisted with ARPA funds. Any type of assistance, uh, when we deduplicate, there's 7,000 households for this uh, example in line 14. They didn't use any CARES, so it's zero in line 15. And they only used ARPA for their disaster relief program, which served 1,000, so we'll put 1,000 in line 16. So these examples are in the slides if you download them and you can look at them in more detail. All right, so some recommendations for IT staff. If you're here, if you wanna pass this along to your, your staff is uh, to, to make sure you have the right fields to identify the benefits a household received and the funds that were used to help provide that benefit. Um, make sure the results of your reports agree with uh, information about how the funds were used that program staff may know. And here's an example approach that they can take to generate statistics. Uh, that that they can review. Next slide. All right, we're gonna go on to some final reminders. And I'll turn it back to Melissa. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> so there are, I'm gonna go through these pretty fast because we have about 10 minutes left. Um, there are no changes to the form structure for 2022 report. Um, as Dan said, the only changes you're gonna see are um, wording or organization. So the fourth line for each type of assistance has been reserved for other supplemental funds releases, but these are not open or editable. So they won't affect your reporting at all. And then the notes section prompts grant recipients to provide necessary explanations regarding your data's reliability or validity. Um, as always, if you're facing challenges with understanding any piece of this at all, please reach out and contact us and we can talk you through it. The final household report is due in OLDC on December 30th. It must contain final data from your tracking systems and your program records. And make sure that once your data are final that you go through and select no in response to the question, do the data below include estimated figures? You should also be unchecking any estimated data check boxes in section one and five or uh, four. And this happens all the time. We get people who don't check, uncheck those boxes. And so we have to call and, and say, is this really estimated data or did you just forget to uncheck the box? So, so keep this in mind. Also remember that the household report submitting an OLDC takes time. Um, you have to enter it, save it, get it certified and submitted. Um, all by the appropriate people. Um, so, and you have to go through any validation checks that crop up. So make sure you're saving yourself some time to get it in. And if for any reason you need help, call a prize. Um, and if you need an extension, make sure that you call your um, liaison and request that. 
This is just an overview of the submission process on OLDC. There is also a set of OLDC instructions at the end of the slide deck that we won't go through, but that might be helpful to you. But once again, there there is a you know a, a process, um, and so you need to go in and save, validate, certify, and submit. And only some people in your office may have permission to certify and submit based on how you set up your OLDC account. So by all means, if you're new to this, go on in and take a look at that and make sure everything is set up so that when it does come time to submit this report, you're not kind of scrambling to do it at the last minute. There are warning messages that you're going to get. We've talked about that kind of throughout this um, slide deck that if you enter something that's contradictory or doesn't look right, OLDC will um, uh, post a valid a validation message for you. And warning messages say, basically, this might be correct, but can you confirm and double check and leave a note? And that's a really nice um, general rule. If you are getting a validation about something, but you know it's correct, you should be automatically adding a note in the notes section that says, yes, I checked this, and yes, this is why it's correct. A fatal error, um, error really means that something, you've entered numbers that are not possible. Um, you've either mistyped or you need to go back and look at your data again, and it won't let you actually submit your household report in OLDC until these particular errors are taken care of. If any of these messages appear, um, and you're not able to resolve it or you have questions, go ahead and reach out and give us a call. Once you submit your report, a prize will alert you to any further issues based on a review. You should provide a response um, as timely as possible to a prize and make corrections to the report. And when a prize confirms the report is complete, the liaison will accept it in OLDC. Your final information will be used for the LIHEAP report to Congress, which is why Prize works so hard to make sure that it's accurate and that all the context is there that's needed um, when people are looking at your data. If you do later identify a correction or change is needed, you uh, would submit a revision in OLDC. So there are changes coming to the household report, and many of you know about this or um, have heard, and this is important to listen to because it's not in the report that you're getting ready to submit, but you should be collecting this data now because it will be necessary to report um, uh, next December, and it will be necessary to report for the year we're in right now. And so these new demographic items correspond to what HHS is asking you to submit for the water program. Um, there's a lot of information out there. There's a dear colleague letter, not a dear college letter, but a dear colleague letter that's out there. And so um, you can go to any of these links and then two federal register notices that really outline what these potential um, demographic items are. And they're still in the approval process, I believe, but these are proposed and you can look at them and begin preparing your system and your applications all the way back to your client applications where they provide you with this data in order to make sure you have it ready for next year's report. Um, the new items that are just very quickly, you're gonna be asked, um, to report on the assisted household main applicant. So some of you might call this the head of household, some of you may call it the main applicant, that'll be further defined in the instructions, but the idea here is that you need to be able to identify the race, the ethnicity, and the gender of the main applicant of each household. And we have the categories listed here. Next slide. Now in 2024, um, this expands. So you're going to be needing to collect owner renter status of the households that you serve. You're gonna be needing to look at the race of all assisted household members, the ethnicity of all assisted household members, and the gender of all assisted household members. So for those of you who are not yet collecting household member data in your system, this is something that you should be gearing up to do. An additional changes is that some things will be removed. It's a miracle. Um, 
in uh, beginning with the 2023 report, it's been proposed that the number of applicant households by assistant type and applicant households by poverty interval will be removed from the federal household report. Now, some of you actually like to collect this because it demonstrates um, a need that you can't meet. You know, for some of you, you say we had a gazillion people apply and we could only serve a million. And so um, this may be something you still collect at the state level, but at the federal level, you won't be required to report that anymore. These are final reminders. The instructions are really valuable to go through if you haven't done that in a while, um, and also valuable to hand to your IT folks who might be helping you put together this report. Um, they're very detailed and helpful. Um, the poverty guidelines, the check before you submit document is also helpful for your IT staff or whoever is putting together this report. And there's a lot of required report support um, on the performance management website. These are OLDC links. We've talked about that a little, but here's the login and the help desk. And once again, we recommend you get in there and take a look at it if you haven't yet, or if you're new, to make sure that everything is set for you to go in when you're ready to put in your data. There are additional webinars coming up for the grantee survey and performance measures report. A webinar in each of these will be offered in December and then repeated in January for those who are unable to attend in December. So we'll be having two webinars on each of those report pieces. Um, HHS will be sending registration information for the webinar soon. And um, this is a kind of random, um, but there's a link out there for LIHEAP data case study vignettes on geospatial analysis. Brian Sarenson from Washington is awesome, and he's got some awesome ways that he's using the data, um, all this data we just talked about, in order to tell a story about his program and do a better job of targeting and outreach. And this little five or so minute video um, gives an explanation of that. And there are other videos as well, so I encourage you to take a look. And a poll. How helpful was this webinar in understanding what is needed to complete the FY22 household report long form? Was it not at all helpful, not too helpful, somewhat helpful, or very helpful? We are going to uh, take some questions. So while you're filling out the poll, if you have any questions, um, we will take them in a minute. All right, we'll close it in another few seconds here. Right, looks like there are no more responses. Yeah, let's close it. All right, well, that's good to hear. Um, I, I did see one question come through I wanted to answer, which was, um, wh why do we not need to report on households separate, uh, separately for the Infrastructure Act funds? That's correct. There's no separate line for infrastructure funds. Um, uh, HHS, you know, understood that, that those are a smaller amount of funds and the report was not changed to collect any separate information for them. So there's no, um, no changes there uh, to, to report separately on anything related to the infrastructure funds for the household report. Uh, any other questions, Nicholas? Yes. Um, so let me see here. Um, we obligated all of our CARES funds in FY 2021. Should we just leave all of the CARES lines blank? Yes, that's correct. So you, you don't need to fill in anything on the CARES lines. We track the CARES and ARPA spending, but our system isn't set up to track this for households. How should we approach this? Um, as Melissa was saying, if you have uh, challenges along, to, along the lines of what your system's tracking, we do encourage you to reach out to us so we can help identify s solutions. Um, you know, usually the CARES or the ARPA funds were used for specific purposes or specific types of assistance. 
and maybe used during specific time periods. So we can, we can, that information can be used to help you identify those households. So we, we can talk about that. Um, if you wanna just jump ahead to the next slide, uh, Nicholas, so they can see it. Uh, as we wrap up here, this is our contact information um, and the information for uh, o OCS liaisons. There, there are some newer OCS liaisons who've started recently, so if you, you need to contact yours, you can find them here. Uh, OLDC as well, if you're having trouble getting in, you can access that from the help desk. Um, but otherwise, I think if there's any further questions, we will uh, follow up with you by email. And uh, really, anything else, Melissa? We, we appreciate everyone's time. No, take care. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, thank you. We appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar in December. Bye-bye.